Coming up on Tech News Today, is drone delivery from Amazon just a publicity stunt or could it be real? Also, Yola promises to convert your Android phone. And is it rude to live tweet a conversation? All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, December 2nd, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TNT12. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by TechServe. TechServe assists U.S. businesses of all sizes with their technology needs, including Apple, Avid, Adobe, and HP solutions. Visit TechServe.com slash TNT and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm Jason Hell. Uh, Sarah Lane out sick today, sadly, but uh, that will not stop us from bringing you the most important stories in the tech world, starting with the top 10 of the day in the news fuse. Jeff Bezos unveiled Amazon Prime Air on 60 Minutes last night, showing off a research project aiming to deliver product, products that weigh less than five pounds uh, within 10 miles of an Amazon delivery center, 30 minutes from order time. The system would use octocopters operated by GPS and an algorithm to drop the packages on recipients' doorsteps, not heads. Bezos admitted the project is four or five years away pending regulatory approval from the FAA, among other logistical problems, you can imagine. Akamai just bought Prolexic, a company that specializes in preventing DDoS attacks as well as protecting data centers. Akamai will pay $370 million in cash for Prolexic, and the deal is expected to close in the first half of next year. The acquisition will help Akamai enter the enterprise like James T. Kirk. Net applications released numbers for OS traffic share in November, and Windows 8.1, with 2.64%, has nudged ahead of OS 10 10.9 Mavericks at 2.42%. Windows 7 is still the largest OS, with 46.64%, followed by Windows XP at 31.22%. Windows 8, without the 0.1, has 6.66% of the traffic, uh, even though Windows 8.1 is a free upgrade. Windows Vista... Somebody act? No? Oh, well, I'll give you the number anyway. 3.57%. And if you're curious about the next version of Windows, Mary Jo Foley at ZDNet says her sources say Microsoft is targeting spring of 2015 with a code name Threshold, and it would update the phone, the Xbox, and the desktop operating system all in one go. YouTube is now available for the Nintendo 3DS and the 3DS eShop in North America and Europe. Since the 3DS uses two screens, the top screen use, uh, is actually the video player, and the bottom screen is where you'll find the scrubber bar and suggested videos. Oddly, the 3DS YouTube app doesn't support 3D video. Huh. Hmm. Incompatible, I guess. Uh, the latest numbers from Cantor World Panel Comtech show Apple's iPhone 5S and 5C sales increasing but still lagging behind what the iPhone 5 sold in its first few months. Still, Apple did very well in Japan with 76.1% of sales in October. The iPhone did well in the U.S. too, grabbing 52.8% of sales in October. In Europe, Windows Phone threatens Apple with 10.2% of the five major markets compared to Apple's 15.8%. Android dominates Europe at 70.9%. Dell is introducing a 24-inch 4K monitor. It's called the Dell UltraSharp 20, Ultra 24, otherwise known as the UP 2414Q. The UltraSharp 24 has a resolution of 3840 by 2160 with 185 pixels per inch. So will this diminutive screen have a diminutive price? Uh, probably not, but Dell hasn't made an official announcement on that price. So you're saying there's a chance. No, I'm not. Probably not. BlackBerry has an open standards policy, open letters. Newish BlackBerry CEO John Chen sent an open letter to its enterprise customers today, following on former CEO Thorsten Hines' open letter a few months ago. Chen's letter says the company is very much alive. The for sale sign has been taken down. 
And the gist of the letter is that BlackBerry understands that companies aren't going back to being BlackBerry-only shops, and that's okay. BlackBerry Enterprise Server 10 is your future enterprise mobility solution, even for iOS and Android devices, he says. Godspeed, John Chen. John Chen forever an optimist. Good for him. Remember the Oppo N1, that 5.9-inch Android phone with the swiveling camera on the top? Well, Oppo just dropped some details via Google Plus post. It's going to cost $599 in the U.S. or €449 Euro and launch on December 10th. The phone will ship with Oppo's skinned Android known as ColorOS, but you'll have a choice of choosing CyanogenMod if you want. Yahoo has purchased natural language outfit Skyphrase for an undisclosed amount of money. Skyphrase and its four-person team will become part of Yahoo Labs in New York, where they presumably will bring their natural language processing skills to Yahoo's search and mail products. Amazon Prime Air and Flying Drones. Psh, the most exciting Amazon news of the day is about state taxes. That's right, I said it. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> the U.S. Supreme Court refused to review a lower court decision that upheld a law that allowed New York State to have an online retailer collect taxes from the purchaser as long as the company advertises in that state. Now, Amazon and Overstock both requested the review, which was denied. Next up, the tax situation will be discussed with the Marketplace Fairness Act, which is stuck in the House of Representatives. You all can wake up now. Good morning. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Squarespace.com, the all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. In fact, Good old Jason Howell's got an album out today. Jason, you use Squarespace for, for your music website, right? Yeah, and I mean, I've been a big fan of Squarespace for a long time, and I host a couple of sites on there. And uh, they recently had a bunch of features kind of built into there for musicians. So I have a new album. It's uh, Yellow Gold Ever One. It released today, but what was kind of cool about it from the site perspective is that I could stage all of these pages and with every along every step of the way, just kind of you know put a push a revision to the front page very easily, display it really nicely, and then the music kind of tailored uh, options it allows you to kind of display you know all of your music out in a very easy to use format. Um, not to mention the kind of scalability to different screen sizes. It just kind of all looks good no matter what Gosh, size of a screen. Yeah you're on. So, I, I mean, I love Squarespace, always have the fact that they're bringing musicians into the fold uh, even better. Yeah. Musicians, commerce, photo gallery, whatever site you've got, uh, you might want to go try it out. It's $8 a month, including a free domain name. If you sign up for a year, it's reliable, it's hosted, it takes care of all the back end stuff for you. Start a free two week trial, no credit card required. Start building your website right now. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TNT12 to get 10% off and to show your support for Tech News Today. We thank Squarespace. They're continuing support of Tech News Today. They've kept us afloat. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. All right, joining us now to discuss the stories of the day, always very excited to have Molly Wood with us on the show. How's it going, Molly? Hello, it's going great. I'm so excited to be here. We got good stuff today, too. I uh, hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Hope you're all, like, fueled up for Tech News. I did. I've got all my like protein and carbs and my brain is working mostly <laughs> properly. We've, been, we've all been carbo loading for this, for this, this round of tech news. Uh, let's start with those drones. Uh, Jeff Bezos, 60 Minutes, Amazon working on octocopter delivery. People have been talking about this since it was a, uh, since it came on the air yesterday. The drones can carry packages up to five pounds, around 10 miles, Bezos says. 30-minute delivery is what they showed off in the demonstration. Now, he does say... Or four or five years away from package delivery. The, the FAA, the earliest they possibly would be allowed to approve of commercial use of drones for delivery would be 2015. And the FAA has said, we're not even going to do it that fast. Probably 2020 would be the earliest uh, that we would do it. Uh, Bezos said that these drones are not going to have people operating them either. Uh, Jason, let's, let's go to the, uh, the quote of Bezos about what autonomous. he said. So you, you give them instructions of which GPS coordinates to go to. And they take off and they fly to those GPS coordinates. What's the hardest challenge in making the, this happen? The hard part here is putting in all the redundancy, all the reliability, all the systems you need to say, look, this thing can't land on somebody's head while they're walking <laughs> around their neighborhood. That's not good. That's not that's good. That's not good. No. Thank you, Charlie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like yeah. that. Uh, but he, but the, it points out that it's not just getting approval. It's also the logistics of making this work. There's lots of things that go, Brian. People talking about shooting them down, all that sort of thing. There's parodies all over the Internet already. Uh, Waterstones in the U.K. has announced their owls 
service. Ha ha. There's also a duck hunt parody where instead of ducks, they have Amazon drones. ZooCal in Australia is going to start delivering textbooks by drone in Australia next year. They would like to bring that here. You probably remember Taco Copter was uh, showed off at uh, one of the TechCrunch events. It's in beta in San Francisco, and they're also working on Lobster Copter. At SP Sheridan in our subreddit, uh, put in a link about how a hexacopter was being used to try to smuggle tobacco and cell phones into a prison. So my question here is not just about the Amazon drone delivery, but it looks like kind of we're, we're an inescapable wave is going to happen. Maybe it's going to be five years, maybe 10. I don't know. But, but Molly, are we going to be having drones filling the skies, delivering us things? Oh, absolutely. No question. It's funny, though, because <clears throat> I was just sitting here thinking about that time that those Mexican drug smugglers built a trebuchet. Remember that? <laughs> yes. And they were like hurling drugs over the border. And I thought, hot damn, drones. They're good to go. Um, no, I, I think that drone delivery is it, it is unavoidable. I mean, it's it's arguably the best commercial use of drones. Um, in fact, there was just in the almost human the last Almost Human episode, the drones were delivering communication devices and all kinds of things. Um, I think I think there are a lot of interesting questions about Amazon's timing in terms of announcing this now and and the the PR stunt factor. Oh, sure, Cyber Monday, right? But, yeah, yeah but, but back to drones, yes, right? Like these are completely useful devices. They can be, the best use of them is to program them to do a thing, go to a place and do a thing and then come back. I mean, that's what every sort of drone hobbyist and drone pro drone programmer is working on right now. Um, so it's just really a matter of getting the FAA on board and figuring out the commercial uses. It's just and then honestly, getting over the whole shooting thing, like get, get over it. The first time you get a pizza by drone, you're going to be fired up. <laughs> but it's like, is Jeff Bezos insane or, or is he a genius? So I can't really tell here because he's insane genius. I guess. So here's the deal. You want to start a company on the internet that's a bookstore that sells everything and then you're going to charge 90 bucks a year to have two day shipping and then they're going to send out robots to send you your products and they're delivering on Sunday and bizarre things like that. This is this is just another huge future play. It's just, it, when I saw the story, I really thought something had gotten hacked and the story was propagating everywhere. It seemed ridiculous. But you know, I was, I was watching Almost Human the other day, too. This is supposed to be the future, right? This is just 2013. So in 20, uh, in 2018, we're supposed to be seeing these things flying around. We're probably going to get used to it, just like you get used to uh, bike couriers, I guess. Of but course. It's just, I'm kind of, I'm really excited if and when this actually succeeds. But this is talking about li being limited to areas that are near actual uh, delivery areas, uh, not delivery areas, um, fulfillment areas. Warehouses, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so that it might not be something that everyone sees all the time. City go dwellers might be a little irritated because how else will they get this stuff? They're going to just show up on the balconies they don't have. Um, but seems really cool. Well, that's no different than right now where they, if they, if you don't have a, the kind of house where they can leave a package and you're not home, you never get it. I mean, that, that to me, that's what the Amazon locker program is supposed to solve. Maybe the yeah, drones will go to lockers. It, the, right now, the drone delivery doesn't solve a huge problem, which is, I think, partly why you can come back to Jeff Bezos trying to make a big PR push right now. And kind of my favorite article about this, honestly, was Dan Lyons' take on it, which was that he pretty cynically used CBS and 60 Minutes to do his bidding on Cyber or right ahead of Cyber Monday, which is like get people saying interesting, good things about Amazon and thinking, man, I just love them. And I can't wait for them to send a little robot to deliver my stuff in 30 minutes or less. Um, I don't even know where I was going with the drone thing on that because I got all mad about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, back, like, back. and we all bought it. Back to However, drone delivery, yes, except that, I, oh, to Ayaz's point, I don't think that right now it solves a huge problem, right? It's it is inevitable. It's going to be an efficient way for companies to use cheap machinery instead of big, like gas guzzling cars. It will probably be more uh, environmentally efficient. At the moment, it's not like it solves a huge delivery need that we all have. We're not sitting here thinking, man, I wish there was a better way for me to get my packages other than having a robot at my house to sign for them when they come. And on the apartment front of that, that, that point, Richard Yaw in the chat were mentioning that the drones could hover outside your window at the apartment. Aha, uh -huh. maybe it would solve a problem. Knocking at the window. <laughs> the yeah, but you're not there. You're not at the apartment. I, I think the compelling thing here, logistical problems aside, is the 30-minute delivery. The idea of, oh, I, I guess I could just pop down to the big box store and buy it because I don't want to wait even a day 
to get this and Amazon says hey we can have it to you within a, a half hour that's that's shorter than it'll take you to go find a parking place go inside buy it and come back uh, if they could pull that off I think that's pretty compelling Let's talk about Yola. Yola launching their Sailfish OS. This is one of the mid-range, low-range competitors to Android, along with Firefox OS, trying to get into that segment of the market. And uh, they're saying some interesting stuff today, IS. Yeah, the Yola CEO, Tomi Pianmaki, gave an interview with the Finnish magazine, whose name I will not even try to pronounce, uh, where he said it's the plan to allow Android device owners to install the Sailfish OS on their devices he says it's fairly easy to install the OS on Android devices. It says that while installing your OS may not be mainstream in Finland, it is mainstream in places like China. Uh, he says that for Yola, it is a possibility to distribute our operating system, especially in China, and the company just has to make sure Sailfish will run on different kinds of Android devices. As for making money, though, it looks like Yola won't get money by selling the operating system, but should be able to get a slice of apps, services, and, or advertising when it comes to that. Molly, do you think Yola's strategy of allowing its operating system to be installed on Android devices, would that lead to mar significant market share or any market share for Selfish? I think it is the only chance of any market share, honestly. So it's it's a very smart approach. And, and they're absolutely right about markets like China or India or markets just where Google doesn't have high penetration and this sort of increasing, like small, still small, but increasing number of people who don't want to use Google for various reasons, most of them privacy related. Um, but significant market share, no. I think it's strategically important and really valuable for companies to keep developing alternatives to, to, to the big three, right? To the big machinery, Microsoft and Apple and Google, because I think there's growing interest in kind of owning your own data and, and, and being a little bit more private from these huge companies. That said, it's not like a, <laughs> there's not gonna be like a Cyber Monday rush to the store for this. No, definitely not. I, I think it's a can't hurt move, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Why not make it available to install on handsets, especially if you need to grab market share? That, that's what you should do. Make the boundaries as invisible as possible to switching to the Sailfish OS. And I think he makes a good point about China, where people are constantly doing Android derivatives and Android forks and, and installing their own operating systems to, to have a cheaper alternative. The question then becomes, okay, you've made it possible. Now people can do it. Why would they? And th th I, that's the part of the argument I'm not seeing yet from Sailfish. It's a lovely operating system. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not dinging it at all. But there has to be a compelling reason for somebody to say, I'm going to choose that one over the Android marketplace, which is more established, is more compatible, and has a, a bigger ecosystem when you're talking about apps. Yes, I think if you can start to make a really compelling privacy argument, that that would be the reason. Because I had the same thought. I'm always the one who's like, this looks hard. I'm not going to do it, right? The, from the consumer perspective, they are often, it, it, when there's an, a layer of complication, they're out. But I do think that if you could start to make a compelling privacy argument, which is that you can have all the benefits of the Android marketplace without having to be tied into Google, that you might start to, to interest the the tour onion router kind of crowd i would and that crowd's growing these days i would love to see uh more companies allowing their operating systems to be installed on on android devices because flat out they're using the same hardware there's very little that's customized about this other than like i know the google play store doesn't allow you to the sign engine mod uh, installer was removed from the play store because it doesn't allow you back into the uh, into google's regular android operating system if it was really simple to switch and you didn't have to change your device or even to try out things, it's it's about ease of use. And, and Molly, you're right. If it's something like, well, do I have to like install it on my from my PC and then tether it and then I get to install it and see some like cryptic looking code go running by, that will f frighten people. But it could just be something as simple as making it really clean looking to side load an, an Android, I guess an actual operating system for an Android device. It's just that since the hardware is pretty much standardized, why hasn't this approach been done before? I thought Microsoft would have tried this because that's kind of their approach for desktops. So why not? But um, well, I and you could argue, you could argue that maybe the hardware isn't as standard. That the really big if in there is the part where they say, as long as we can get it to work on all Android devices, and that that alone is a much bigger and scarier mm -hmm. statement than you know. I mean, yeah. the, even as Android, long as. even all Google do has it. a problem getting Android <laughs> to run consistently across all the Android devices. Like that's not a small, that's a non-trivial hurdle that they have brought oh. up there as like a casual aside.
Earlier this month, Stephen Wolfram announced something called Wolfram Language, and uh, John Keats here on VentureBeat has a lot more details. He sat down and talked with Wolfram about it. Uh, Wolfram said, Mathematica is the perfect, precise computation engine. Of course, Mathematica famously created by Stephen Wolfram. Wolfram Alpha, the sort of search engine, knowledge engine, whatever you want to call it, is general information about the world. And Wolfram says, now we can combine the two. Uh, it has natural language programming to a certain extent. That means you can you can create natural language phrases to create the programs, not that you can just say whatever you want and it'll do it. Uh, but data and code are treated as one. Everything can be symbolic expression. So it has 11,000 pages of documentation. It's, it's definitely not a simple thing. But as an example, during this article, he described a program to call up a map of Europe and highlight Germany and France in different uh, colors. Remember, that may sound really easy, but instead of saying, okay, I'm going to draw the map of Europe, and then I'm going to tell the program where Germany is, and then I'm going to tell the program where France is, the program already knew this stuff. Germany is not a variable that is assigned. Uh, it, it's not an object or a class that's being called. It's a phrase that the programming language knows and understands. It knows what Germany is. It knows the significance and meaning and can pull it into the program with very little effort and no external data sources because it pulls it out of Wolfram Alpha. Uh, so he says coding that took hours or took days can now take hours. 10,000 lines of code can be done in as little as 200, maybe less. And he says what we're trying to do is that the programmer defines the goal and the computer figures out how to achieve that goal. That's different than telling the computer to go figure out something new which is interesting. That's a different challenge. That's sentient computing. Wolfram's interested in doing that as well. So Wolfram language might lead to some sort of sentient computing down the road. Molly, any guesses as to how practical this will end up being and, and what effect it might have? It's funny because if you look at the way that we compute, if you look at the the, the expectations, you know, we always talk about how how people get so frustrated with their technology because the the what it can do leads to the expectation of what it should do. And when when I read what Wolfram's talking about here, I think to myself, this is what it should be able to do, right? Like, I know that this base of knowledge exists and that that knowledge includes almost everything that humans have ever said, done, thought, or written down. So why can't a computer absolutely naturally, especially now that they're all connected for the most part, communicate with that bank of knowledge and not need so much help? Right. Like it just feels sort of natural that I should be able to call up my phone and say, navigate to the blah, blah, blah. And it will know what that is and and find it and give me the best route and know where I came from. So it's sort of like all of the things that Google wants to do with with the with its sort of pattern recognition, but much, much, much more. And I don't see why it's not possible and I don't see why it's not possible soon. Like we have the horsepower, we have the connectivity to to, to me. The biggest barrier possibly is the connectivity, the idea that machines are not connected enough to be able to access information quickly enough. Because it, if you're depending on local storage of the Wolfram database, then that's not going to work. But I mean, I think it's unbelievably ambitious, but at the same time, it's totally intuitive. Like it just makes sense that this is how, how computers should talk to each other and talk to us. Yeah, looking at this thing, that that one of the reasons why we haven't had computers that can do what it should is the amount of programming necessary. And this this line about ten thousand lines becomes two hundred. That mm -hmm. makes it a lot more efficient. So if you're going to spend your time doing this, you're not just you know researching and trying to figure out uh, what's broken with your actual code because you forgot to close a tag or something silly like that, or you didn't define a variable like Germany. All these these things, if it can it can connect to all that data. And it can make it a more, more abstract kind of idea that you can just program in a more natural way. It would be really intriguing if it takes off because if you have people who have time and they want to actually code and make something happen like app-wise and they can use this kind of language, it could be really intriguing. Although I think, I want to say Apple tried that with Apple Script. It's supposed to be a natural language interface, but it's really not really that great a thing. But this is yeah. Wolfram we're talking about. So this is not like, oh, well, it's something that won't be a, a supported for a long time. 11,000 pages of documentation this could be huge, especially because it can be very efficient. It That's just it. Like the efficiency, I think, is what appeals to me and why I find this so, I mean, I just, I could talk about this all day. I'm in love with this concept, partly because I've been reading a lot of like crazy sci-fi lately and it just feels like 
these are these are the kinds of things that get me all excited about the future that we're going to live in, right? How inefficient is it for coders all over the world to be constantly defining variables that exist in a database on the web and are easily accessible in microseconds, milliseconds, and yet you have to sit there and code it in and specifically say that you want it, you know, computers are smarter than that. Computers should not have to be told to go find Germany, right? They know they like have mom. Germany. I, just, I, I shouldn't have to tell you to find Germany, computer. I shouldn't, exactly. You should like, just know. That, for God's sake, well, no computers. You should this just is the know. Hard thing. This is the hard thing to wrap your head around. This is not Google's knowledge graph. This is not saying go out on the web and use a semantic search algorithm to figure out what Germany is and then pull that Wikipedia article and, and parrot those results. Wolfram Alpha does some things like that. But what he's describing in this paper is that it actually knows what Germany is without having to have a database. It does, isn't just taking and creating a Wikipedia article. It actually understands what the boundaries are. It understands what all of the associations are. Another example they gave in this article is uh, telling where the International Space Station is. The way Google, if you typed in where's the International Space Station, would do it is find out the data. Go to the websites that can tell you where the International Space Station is and then bring you that data. What Wolfram language would do is say, I know that the International Space Station is uh, in orbit and I know its velocity and I know when it launched and I can calculate quickly where it is and tell you. It can figure it out itself. I, I'm not even sure that I understand it correctly and I may be getting it wrong. You know, so those those of you who work at Wolfram who know this better can can correct this. But it is it is doing a lot more than say what Apple's natural language has done or other natural language programs have done in the past, it, at least if it is doing what he describes in this article and, and in his own blog post about it earlier this month. Very it's, exciting. It's very fascinating. And even he says that it is, you know, the hardest thing that he's ever tried to verbalize. So, it, so it's possible that we are only understanding a small fraction of it the way that, that Stephen Wolfram has envisioned it. Um, but to me, it feels like it's giving... I mean, it's it's endowing uh, pattern recognition on machines. It's connecting them together and 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 allow, and giving computers a way to express the knowledge that they have all the time. If that makes sense. It does. It does. Sounds we a little anthropomorphic, but yeah, we could probably talk about this all day. But we should we should get uh, get moving and uh, thank one of our other sponsors for today's show, Gazelle.com, because they know you want money. They don't need a database to tell you that, uh, and they know you got gadgets. So if you're thinking about getting a new iPad or a new iPhone, and you got an old phone laying around, or maybe an old iPad, or maybe a Nexus Seven, or maybe a BlackBerry. Go to Gazelle and turn it into cash. G A Z E L L E dot com. Find your item. Tell Gazelle the condition. They'll even buy broken iPhones and iPads. Get a risk free offer for your gadgets and free shipping. And you'll get paid by check, by PayPal, or an extra 5% with an Amazon gift card. Go to gazelle.com now. Get an offer for your iPhone or your iPad. I've sold to them. It's trustworthy. They've paid more than $100 million to over 700,000 customers. And it's easy, free shipping, fast processing. You don't have to list things and describe them. You just tell them. You answer a few questions about what you got. They'll check it out, say, yep, that's it. Send you your money. What's your iPhone worth? Take a minute. Go to gazelle.com to find out. Do it now because your iPhone may lose value the longer you wait. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support of tech news today. Ah, a Linux worm. We've heard tales of these before, Iaz. What's this one about? I think we're going to need a Linux chaser first. It's the Linux chaser. <laughs> Who found that, Jason? <gasps> what? Somebody found that. I don't that. know what you're talking okay. about. I don't know where that came from. It's, anyway. it's on the internet. Go, it's, go search for it. It's on the internet. It. Okay, so let's talk about this Linux worm. Uh, researchers at Symantec found a Linux worm capable of infecting connected devices like set-top boxes, security cameras, and routers. It's called Linux.Darlos. And it's classified as a low-level threat because right now it only targets devices that run on Intel CPUs. It's actually hard-coded into there. As an aside, by the way, Intel just introduced a new division for Internet of Things uh, on November 6th, and it's based on Atom and Quark. And so they want to be in all the things. Uh, uh, back to the Linux more modification to the malware could lead to more uh, infections of devices that run on ARM and other processors as well. And Linux at Darlos generates IP addresses and looks for machines with well-known IDs and passwords. So, like, if you have a router where it's admin, admin, it's going to look for that. It's going to put in those username and passwords, and then it's going to infect the machine. From there, it downloads uh, it downloads the, the worm from the server and then looks for another target. 
So my question to you, Molly, is when is this going to lead to a massive panic that all smart devices will kill us? <laughs> um, I mean, when people start to take computer security roughly 1,000 times more seriously than they take it now. Like, sys admins are freaking out, for sure. Because the Internet of Things is a massive security nightmare waiting to happen. Um, but individuals, I don't think, are going to be worried about it. And some of this is like some this feels a, a little bit like proof of concept in the way that remember a couple of years ago when smartphone viruses were going to kill us all yes, and right. that there was going to be a massive outbreak of smartphone viruses, smartphone viruses and people were going to have their identities stolen left and right. And you could never click a link that you got from a text or anything that didn't occur. And I don't know why. And I, I'm certainly not trying to invite it, but too soon for a freak out. Yeah, well, and, and the the funny thing with the, these stories always are, and I'm glad you brought up the smartphone things because that's a great example of what I'm about to talk about. We always freak out about the new thing. Uh oh, there's a there's a virus for the Internet of Things, and what is that going to do? It's going to kill it. Well, how many Windows machines do you have in your house running right now, or if you're in your office place? Guess how many viruses there are out there that are much more lethal, much more harmful than this one, which is a proof of concept that only runs on Intel and PHP that hasn't been patched over the last 18 months. And, and you're not freaked out about that. You don't need to be freaked out about this. This tells me two things. One, the Internet of Things has finally passed a, a hurdle uh, in that it's got a virus attacking it. And Linux as well uh, it should, should be seen as, a, as <laughs> having made it. Because, you know, hey, you've got Linux in your routers and your Internets of Things and everything. That's a viable operating system right there because people are trying to target it with a virus. Yeah, but Windows and, and Mac OS X and, and smartphone op operating systems are updated quite regularly. And then they are, like, there are forced updates where if you don't do this, you're going to be uh, vulnerable to these these uh, these these worms and things, the malware. So when it comes to Linux and these smart devices that might not be bothering to upgrade their firmware, I don't know when's the last time you upgraded the firmware on your router. A lot of people just don't do that, so that could be well, an issue in the in the long run. I, I'm not saying people are going to even notice it. I'm just saying the other side of it is kind of like who is updating their firmware on their toaster. When that happens. If we, I mean, if we get to a point where we truly have Internet of Things, for uh, you know, for one thing, we're gonna the Internet of Things will be powered by relatively unsophisticated sensors, so it's not like your toaster is necessarily going to be a really intelligent piece of machinery that needs, you know, big time upgrades, and it will be connected all the time. I, th I actually think that the updating and security, uh, security update features, could be a lot simpler because devices will be online. And you, it could be invisible. It could be more transparent. It doesn't necessarily have to, you know, as the threat increases, so can the, the, the capability to prevent it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we and, and, and I, as you bring up a really good point, which is this is a wake up call for these kinds of devices that, hey, you can't live with security through obscurity anymore. You're going to have to do the same thing Windows did in the late 90s and early 2000s and figure out a way to protect people from their own ignorance uh, and, and update yourself and keep yourself secure. Update your PHP, update pa update your routers automatically. And that's going to cause problems and, and it's going to be an issue for a while. And, and if it follows the path that other devices have, it will work through it. We'll figure it out and it won't be perfect, but it also won't be the disaster that many people might be fearing when they see stuff like this. So All many right, ways to die. Yeah, so many ways to die. <laughs> Uh, let's let's talk about this uh, this thing that actually entertained us during our Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, Elon Gale and Diane. He was it was a, a live tweeting hit on Thanksgiving Day. Elon Gale is a, a producer. Uh, Diane was a woman complaining on an airplane. He started live tweeting first what she was saying and then his own interactions with her. Uh, and if you really want to know what happened. Just search for those two words. You can find out the whole story. But it's not the first live tweeting of conversations. Uh, Tom Matzi on an Amtrak train from D.C. to New York. We talked about it right here on Tech News Today. Live tweeted former NSA director Michael Hayden's conversation with the reporters. And then Hayden came over and talked to him. They took a picture and all of that sort of thing. Comedian Kyle Ayers was live tweeting a rooftop breakup. A lot of people found that hilarious. Uh, we were all chuckling as we read the, the Twitter post over Thanksgiving dinner, but Nisha Chital at MSNBC, and I, I actually uh, saw this at, on your Twitter feed, Molly, uh, yeah. wrote a really thought-provoking medium post saying, hey, is this good? Do we not have a right to have conversations with our families, friends, and colleagues in public without strangers 
taking sides, mocking us, judging us, and posting it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she called it part of sort of a culture of public shaming, um, which I which I thought was a good way to put it. I mean, I, I came down with Nisha on this one because that was the response that, that I had as well, which is that I, it's, you know, it's just, and I got into a little Twitter argument with some people about it. And I, you know, for me, it is not a conversation about the expectation of privacy. So a lot of people said, you're in public, you're fair game, you're screwed. Um, but that is not the approach that most people have, you know, if, if someone comes and takes their picture and posts it online or the Google car drives by and, and peeks in their window. Like there's expectation of privacy, but then there's also to me just basic human respect. I mean, everybody is going through something at any given point. And, and the idea that you have this big megaphone, this big outlet to, to make fun of them, to reveal their personal lives, it, it, maybe it's semi-anonymous, but it doesn't really matter. Like, pardon my language, but it's a dick move. And I feel like there are a lot of people, and, and this is just part of sort of learning how to live with technology, right? There's a lot of people in the world. We have a lot of tools for broadcasting that we never had before. But you know what? Have some basic respect for for the, the humans around you. And don't you don't you don't need to tweet their life. It's it's it's, it's you're properly phrasing it here because it's not about law. It's it's no. not about what you have the right to do. I mean, I have the right to go up to anyone in public and interrupt them uh, and and start talking to them and and start arguing with them. And people don't do that. It's a matter of respect. I ask, what do you think about this? I mean, is this the kind of thing where like it's it, it, we're not talking whether it should be against the law to live tweet a conversation, but is is it rude? Is it rude? Absolutely rude. I mean, the the whole law aspect I think is one of the reasons why it's still happening. It's you're allowed to do this. Uh, if you're out in public, yeah, sure, you can do this. But should you? It, it's it might just be another growing pain of something like Twitter or a Facebook or any of these things where people are still figuring out what they can say. This is actually isn't that different than like cyberbullying in some degrees, where you just come after somebody and you post horrible things about them online. If you're going to be doing this and you're like, ha ha, isn't this funny? Because the guy behind me doesn't know I'm tweeting this. I mean, that seems like it's just it is just flat out rude. Why bother doing this? Uh, but you're always going to have jerks, right? It's just, it's really very, it's very hard to, to deal with. You just, you know, sometimes when I want to go to a sporting event and I want to sit there peacefully and enjoy the game, there might be another fan for the, for the other team behind me just being a real uh, fun person. That thing you said, Molly. <laughs> yes. And so, <laughs> and so, I, it's, it, but it's on me not to turn around and like cause a fight or any of that stuff. So it's, you're always going to, wherever you go, the larger, well, or, the, well, the, not to mention you know the anonymity is, of You know the what internet. it is? It is the, the live tweeting. Like if this guy, Elon, who I'm sorry, was appalling, like behaved appallingly to this other person, did not make the situation better in the least. If, if someone is, so there's two things that bother me about this. One is the sense of entitlement. And I, Tom has heard me say this a million times. No, none of us, have a, some sort of God-given unalien, unalienable right not to be annoyed by other people. Like that's just not, we, we, other people can, you can act how you want in public and so can other people, but them doing that doesn't, it doesn't endow you with the ability to like be more outraged than anybody else, right? I call it's like only person in the world syndrome. So A, you're in public too. So you may be annoyed by other people. You've got to find a way to deal with it that doesn't involve like trying to make them the villain because every villain is the hero of his own story. So it's the, it's the, it's the sense of entitlement and like righteous outrage that I find just gross about this particular story, the airplane story. And then there's also the fact that like, if you want to deal, it's passive aggressive. It's actually quite cowardly to just live tweet someone's conversation. If it's something where they're annoying you, just have, just talk to them, have a conversation. I, just, I, yeah, it's I, I think, and, and it's hard to get into not just talking about the Elon Gale situation because Diane was obviously very annoying as well, right? And or so you not, have a, yeah, or you have a not, clash. Right, like maybe there. she was being rude, but, but he has no idea what her circumstance is. Well, no, but and, I'm saying Elon was annoyed by her, right? And right, she was yeah. annoyed by him. So. Okay, now we have two annoyed people. I've done the thing where somebody got kicked off a plane and I heard what it was said. I don't talk, I don't give the person's name. I just say, wow, this just happened. 
to me, that's okay because it did happen, right? And I'm not out to embarrass anyone in particular. I'm just like, what a weird thing that that, that just occurred. Right. And I and I think there's situations where you overhear a funny thing and you say, overheard this. And again, you don't attribute it. You don't try to, to shame. It's the public shaming thing where I, I start to agree with you, Molly, because I, I think, hey, if you're in public, you should be aware as a person that anything you say can be heard and passed along in any kind of way, whether it's the Internet or not. Right. You just need to be aware of that to yourself. I, I also don't say that that excuses you as a person to go around deciding that you're the judge and jury and publicly shaming people or not. Right. And, you know, and people may not may not be shamed. This might just become part of the kind of the, the global conversation that Forbes has a. Uh, Alex Kantrowitz wrote an opinion piece today saying that maybe the public shaming is not a bad thing because it will <laughs> encourage people not to act so badly in public. I wish that that were the case. People will always behave badly in public. That's just kind of because people are different and, and, and badly is subjective in some cases, not every case. And it, yeah, I think there's, Again, it's we're all just figuring out the boundaries of our new yeah. this new future that we live in. And so we may we may decide kind of socially that overheard is okay. You know, we're all gonna we're sharing, so we're obviously gonna recount a lot of different things that happen to us, but that that quoting someone's conversation in bulk, especially when those people are like in pain or having some sort of an emotional situation, that, that that's actually you're also being a jerk when you do that. There's two I, I, jerks. Two jerks on that plane. It's it's a you totally nailed it that this is an interesting aspect of our society growing up and figuring out how to use its new tools that it has created is exactly what we're seeing happening without without saying what what those rules would be because I don't think any of us know we're we're all trying to figure it out you know we all have ideas I think this is okay and I think that's not okay that's what well, that's what's going on is we're try, we're we're experimenting trying things seeing where those lines are and people like you say people are different and people are going to have different ideas until we all sort of come to a consensus of of what is appropriate behavior in public and and what isn't uh, and you're, and you're going to have incidences like this along the way. Mm -hmm. no, this this is this is appropriate too because I wanted to play this just a few seconds ago. But... <laughs> <laughs> there but you I'm, go. Oh, I'm in a good mood now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Someone well, in the chat room told me it was only like a five out of ten rant. I, I, I thought, thought it was well, good. That was early on, though, but I think you got going. Yeah, you yeah, got going. You, ramped up. Up. you covered a lot of ground. It's a ramp up. The Gale guy is an a hole. <laughs> <laughs> all right uh twitter by the way uh you may th say well of course this you're gonna have this kind of thing on twitter because all the old people all the cranky old people well it's not true because we got some data coming out about who uses twitter i guess it's the cranky young people apparently that's Tom. right this twitter twitter's ipo quiet period is over it's like 25 days where the, nobody can say anything about him so here come the twitter stories a new survey saying that twitter's global audience has a lot of young people 32.3% of its global web audience is aged 15 to 24. Now, if you compare to the Facebook, Facebook's got a 28.9% uh, for that same age group. The survey's from Comscore and has ties to J.P. Morgan analyst Doug Anmuth. And by the way, J.P. Morgan is one of the underwriters of the Twitter IPO, so take this how you will. Uh, in the U.S., 18.2%. That's how they get the data, yeah. In the U.S., 18.2% of Twitter users are in the 18 to 24 demo, Facebook 14.1%. And the leader in 65 and over in the U.S. and worldwide for social networks, LinkedIn. Go figure. Uh, so, Molly, now that Twitter's got teens, what could make Twitter be something that they continuously use as opposed to being like a passing fad like MySpace? Twitter's got teens. Well, Twitter already, though, uh, has... I think what appeals... Okay, if you think about the way that teens live right now that we're we're on this idea of how our society is changing i've decided to change my title by the way to tech philosopher because all i really care about is tech and its impact on our lives so you've got these teenagers and they're mobile all the time and they are moving faster than humans have ever moved before so they're not going to sit down and create a profile and tweak the pages and choose the likes and the dislikes they're about just like rapid fire real-time communication so twitter already wins in from that perspective they're not the ones who are in this big time sink of like reading every post on facebook and going down the rabbit hole they're just they're just talking back and forth the snapchat and the twitter and the and sending pictures and i think that twitter's recent moves to make itself sort of more more picture friendly more media friendly make it more of a sharing service those 
are all, I think, useful. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think that teens will migrate more to services like Snapchat that are, that are more, that are geared toward more private instantaneous conversation. Cause at some point, even the children of today have to realize that Twitter is a public conversation and they need to like watch it. Yeah, and, but I, I think you I think you hit on it though. Twitter is where they're like, well, it's fast and easy, and yeah, it's public. But I'll use Snapchat when I don't want to be public. I think it's I think what's interesting about this is it seems to me that Twitter is a tool that appeals to everybody because it's limited, because it's only 140 characters, because it's it's you can follow anyone, anyone can follow you unless you make it private, which you can. Uh, but that's kind of not the gestalt of it, and and. Those rules are easy to keep in mind. Facebook, it's like, oh, where are my settings and who am I friends with? And now my family is writing these long posts that I don't want to see. I hear all those kinds of conversations and complaints about it. I think Twitter's mm -hmm. brilliance is its simplicity. And I see indications that maybe Twitter wants to make itself a little more complex by adding in tiles and videos. And I wonder if that's going to undermine that utility as they go I along. Definitely agree with that. I am now finding Twitter to be distracting. I don't want all this embedded media. I want it to be simple and easy, as uh, like as close to command line as you can get. I mean, I find that uh, anymore, even blogging is like, I, I'll I'll have an idea for a blog post, and blogging feels like too much work. The like I just want to tweet it. The the feature creep in Twitter has been slow and gradual to the point where you see an embedded tweet. It used to be about like this big, and it was like two lines, and now it could basically look like a blog post. Because you either have an embedded news story, embedded video, a Vine video, or you have something else in there. So they're becoming just gigantic, even though it started off as 140 characters. And then people decided to change that over time. I, I, I mean, I know Twitter's IPOing soon, and that's going to, you know, it's, it has to have a long-term model. We've seen them uh, get in bed with all of these television companies, making sure they have all this metric data, all this stuff. Twitter's, you know, the, the pulse of the world kind of thing. But the question is, how long can it survive because it, there's, there's a difference between something like a Coca-Cola where you have a brand and people are like, I drank that as a kid. I would keep drinking it when I'm an older person. But there are things that just come and go. Services come and go. Like, you know, if you asked me 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, what, what's your search engine? What will you always use? Alta Vista. But, like, <laughs> that changes. Services Info change. Yeah. <laughs> Search.com for all of uh, Well, then they absolutely do, which is why I think it's valuable yeah, why the interesting part of those charts to me is that Twitter is skewing younger and Facebook is not. I mean, I think we've all come to the realization that Facebook is like for old parents <laughs> and that kids don't want to use it anymore, you know? And so, so yeah. it's actually, it is to Twitter's benefit that it's getting that kind of adoption. It is now, I think, incumbent on them not to screw it up. All right, with that, we fire up the randomizer. <laughs> We had a straw poll today, and 61% of the folks in our live audience said they wanted to hear us talk about the Amazon Kindle Fire commercial that mocks the iPad Air with the Johnny Ive parody. So they, they've got somebody with an English accent talking about the amazing light iPad Air. And then, of course, someone with an American accent comes in and talks sense to them about how the Kindle Fire is just as good. And, in fact, it's lighter, and they could just go take their order of the British Empire and shove it up their iPad Air connector or something. That's not what they say, but you get the gist. But kind of. The iPad is only $4.99. What I wonder, though, we've seen, we've seen Microsoft going after Apple. We've seen Microsoft going after Samsung recently. Do they, is this just like political attack ads? Like you only do them when you're behind. I think Microsoft has gotten so aggressive, yeah, like have. so aggressive, like a big dumb drunk guy at a party. <laughs> you know, I just, it feels like this sort of, I hate to use the B word, but it feels like they're trying to scare people into submission. And they, and they, no question, have stirred up their fanboys to do that on their behalf. Like you're, they're just sort of trying to, to subject us to this barrage of like anger and bullying and it's exhausting. Yeah, like a, and I don't think it's a good long-term strategy. Like people follow you when they love you. Like a big, tall, red-faced guy throwing chairs. All right? Angry you know yelling. exactly who I'm talking about. That guy. Microsoft's <laughs> like being that guy. It's like, you know what? You might be scary and you might be popular when you're in high school, but later on, like no one's going to like you. 
Well, but now Amazon's doing it too, though. I mean, this 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 randomizer is about Amazon picking on it. Are they bullying, or they're just noticing details that are true? It's like, okay, well, this costs less, and it's it works this way. It's like, okay, that's very nice. But Apple always hangs its hat its hat on being premium. They have the like a huge tablet uh, a app experience versus something like an Android. Amazon doesn't mention the whole fact that they have the whole bifurcated Android thing going right now. So it, it's it's just a standard ad. Especially the timing makes all the sense. If you're going to spend money on something for the holidays. Amazon's is like, hey, look, we have happen to have this. Although, I do have issue with them calling it Prime Air. You know, we were talking about before, and this one is called the iPad Air. I think it's... Yeah. Oh. I, I mean, yeah. it is. And I did... I Sorry, I got so distracted by Microsoft. But I... <laughs> I did, I'm so annoyed by their behavior lately. I think any ad like this... You're, I think, Tom, you're absolutely right that it's like attack ads, but they always do feel desperate. You're absolutely Apple right. had its attack ads to get you to switch from Microsoft Windows because mm -hmm. OS X is behind Windows, right? I mean, I, th I think that's as simple as that. It's when, you, when your market share is lower, you do the attack ad because you feel like, oh, I can only, I can only take. When you're ahead, you want to, you, you, when, then you risk looking negative and you want to just like stay build classy. on. Yeah. yeah, stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> that's and, it, and sometimes it's worth it, right? I mean, Apple yeah. switcher ads did work and they created a cultural gestalt. What I don't, what I dislike, I think about this Amazon ad in particular is it, don't don't rip off the advertising that you wish you could emulate in trying to tear it down. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's kind of the Johnny Ive parody that makes it a little. It's just a little ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Let's say take a quick break and thank our other sponsor, uh, TechServe, New York's premier authorized Apple reseller. If you haven't heard me talk about uh, these new terminals in LaGuardia, in New York, or or in Toronto or Minneapolis, uh, you got to check them out. Uh, the Delta terminals have an iPad at every seat. Travelers can sit anywhere. They can they can check email. They can order food. They come with with like forks. <laughs> and spoons. Uh, and, and this is a complicated thing. OTG Management is the hospitality company that runs the terminals. And they said, look, we'd love to do this, but how do we roll out all these iPads and keep them safe, keep them running? Well, that's why they turned to TechServe, the natural place to sell, support, personalize, configure, and manage massive iPad projects from the Delta terminals to a school with 700 chef instructors to an operation that delivered personally configured iPads, personally configured iPads to 3,000 cable technicians. TechServe does all that stuff, full lifecycle management. All your tech needs, providing the devices you need, getting them up and running, teaching you and your staff how to effectively use them, not just dropping them on the door and leaving, and maintaining them so that they continue to work efficiently. TechServe also provides ongoing support. So if your enterprise has a problem, helps just a phone call away. If your business is considering integrating iOS technology at your workplace, then contact TechServe today and receive a complimentary iPad deployment assessment. That's T E K. S-E-R-V-E dot com slash T-N-T, TechServe. They'll help you assess your current or future iPad needs and give you advice to make it a success. That's TechServe.com slash T-N-T. We thank TechServe for their support of Tech News Today. I believe we have voicemail and an email. Incoming message. First, the voicemail comes from Lawrence in Virginia with an idea of what Apple could do after buying PrimeSense, the sensor maker. Yeah, this is Lawrence from Herndon, Virginia. And I was thinking with PrimeSense, Apple could add in an enhanced lip reading feature to uh, make uh, speech to text more accurate. I was just thinking, love the show. This I love because talking to your phone, I never want to do because I'm in public, right? And I just, I don't, I don't want to be overheard. I don't want to be live tweeted talking to my phone. But if you could just mouth it, Nobody hears you. You're not bothering anybody, and your phone knows what you're saying. That's a, I don't know if that's what Prime Sense is up to, but I love the idea. It's not bad, although I talk to my phone shamelessly in public all the time anyway, and I don't even care. But I would never live tweet you doing it. I just want to thank you. I appreciate that. that would Thanks. probably be a boring live tweet, though. Like, I was going to say, navigate to. Can you imagine <laughs> this lady? This lady in Target is saying um, punctuation out loud. Right. Comma. Can you oh believe gosh. she just said comma? Prices. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> I'm going to tweet that. Comma. I'm so embarrassed for her right now. <laughs> <laughs> My overwhelming sense of personal superiority just is oozing at every pore. <laughs> you. 
Ew. All right, no, we got sorry. an email too, Ayas. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to correct myself real fast. I said Twitter didn't IPO yet. I must have had a just a, a brain problem there. Twitter read IPO, so don't write emails about that. Uh, thanks, late. chat room. That's oh, already written. So Charles writes in, first time, long time. Really enjoyed the discussion about Bitcoin on Wednesday. Quite a, a few good points were brought up and have been discussed in the past regarding the value and volatility of a concept still in its infancy. The thought that always rolls around in my head is the 21 million artificial ceiling. I say artificial because, with all, as with all tech, it can be very flexible. IPv4, Bitcoin could be broken down into smaller units or have an IPv6 with greater length slash complexity. If they maintain the limit, how does this ultimately affect its value? Does the scarcity encourage people to hoard them, driving up the price until it's rendered useless, Tom? Or will it be usurped by a currency without a limit? Its end is shaped by many still forming variables, regulation, acceptance, and security, to name a few. I was looking for your thoughts because it's truly hard to see that far down the road. So fraught with curves. Love the show. Keep up the good work. I, I think those are all great questions that a lot of people would like to know the answers to as well. I do think that uh, the the limitation on the number of Bitcoins is just part of the, the system of saying we will continue to add Bitcoins to the system to, to kind of grease the wheels. And hopefully by the time they get to the 21 million or whatever it is, then the system is is safe enough and and is going enough that they don't need to motivate people to participate by giving them new bitcoins by doing the mining because you're right you can you can just split them and that's true of any currency you can just split it into smaller and smaller pieces bitcoin is very fascinating well that is it for this episode of tech news today molly wood thank you for joining us my pleasure i had such a good time uh, it's always great to have you. Uh, TheMolly.com. Anything in particular to let people know about before we head out of here? No, except that um, for those of you who don't know, I left CNET. I keep getting tweets about when the next season of Always On is going to start. <laughs> and uh, I am currently chilling. I'm weighing options, and I'll be back on the internet in force after the new year. We'll have another season of It's a Thing, if nothing else. I know you'll yes, have plenty of Yes, we definitely else, will. Let's, let's, yeah. let's get on that. We'll be a, we'll, we'll keep, So keep many things, so little time. Uh, don't forget your subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com, to let us know what stories we should you think we should talk about on the show. That's one of the places we look. You can email us, tnt at twit.tv. Give us a call, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash technewstoday. And, of course, subscribe to the podcast, get the show notes and all that good stuff at twit.tv slash TNT. Brian Brushwood joins us tomorrow on the show. We'll see you then. Yeah.